All right. So, um, hi everybody. I am Bruce Carnahan, AKA the guy in the blue shirt. And, uh, we're just doing a little setup here. So, um, I'll take the opportunity to introduce myself. I am a relatively new LinkedIn live presenter and uh, I actually got into LinkedIn live through somebody actually that Lois knows. So we'll come back to that in a minute. And um, I met Patrick through a LinkedIn local event down in Los Angeles. And I think it was about 15 months ago. So um, I'm just going to make sure we are actually live here before I bring Lois on. And so it's getting, I'm based in Canyon Country, California, and uh, it is starting to cool down, thank goodness. It's been mega, mega hot here. And uh, thank you, Gracie Ruth. Uh, she, I've got the thumbs up that we are actually seen and live. So I want to go ahead and introduce my wonderful guest today, Lois. And uh, Lois, why don't you, hi. Why don't you take the opportunity to introduce yourself and also uh, say where you're located and then we'll get into our conversation about unlearning from college here. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so hi, guys. I'm Lois Sal, and I am a recent grad from Pepperdine University. Um, I was also the TEDx Pepperdine University marketing director, formerly the production designer, so I created the stage. And I am based in West Hollywood right now, California. Right. And uh, you actually know Patrick Ward, right? I do. I am familiar with him. <laughs> You're good friends and working colleagues, as I understand it, correct? Yes. Yes. All right. Good for you. Mm -hmm. So um, Lois and I, uh, we may have a little technical delay. So if you see a little delay, hang with us. Um, Lois had some internet issues, which I think are getting fixed this week, right? Yes, it's so much. Hey, it looks like we're good. So fingers crossed, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah. well, we've been uh, just kind of warming up to make sure we had the connection here. So uh, thanks, Gracie Ruth, for coming on. And uh, Galen, uh, welcome. I've not said hello to you before. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the things you've been out of uh, university for six months now. Is that right? Yes. We're coming in six months in a few weeks. So very six exciting. Months yeah. yeah. So if you were reflecting on the last six months of, you know, some of the things of unlearning, what, what will be the first thing that stands out for you, Lois? Yeah, definitely. I've got a whole list of things. would be to set realistic goals. I think in high school and even in college, I think college is very symptomatic of this where your peers, your professors, your mentors will all ask you, what will you do in the next five years? And I think that is a great question, but I think we're so fixated on it that we've created unrealistic goals. And so professors would say, I could totally see working at, you know, FANG or the big five. And that's kind of the vision for all kids. I don't think I've ever heard any of my um, peers or classmates or friends say, no, I want to start small, I want to do this, and then I'll move on to that. And I think just graduating within these six months, I've noticed that that might not be the most fruitful mindset, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Right. So uh, what would you adjust or what, uh, what guidance could you give to uh, some peers maybe that are still in the system? What would you help them with? Yeah, definitely. I think a big lesson for me right now is obviously to piece it together instead of having one massive goal, like saying you want to be marketing director for X, Y, and Z large company or large entertainment company. That's a big one at Pepperdine. Um, bringing that into smaller opportunities or stepping stones is what I like to call it. I mm -hmm. actually took inspiration for this mindset from a book by Mark Manson. What was it called? The subtle art of not giving a, you know what. Right. And he says, there's a point in not thinking you are going to reach that goal, but knowing that with each and every day, you're going to be better. So doing that one little thing 
each day is going to get you there without you being fixated and you reminding yourself, I still have a long way to go or how come this person's there and I'm not yet. And Mm -hmm. I think something as simple as just being a little bit better each and every day, no matter what it is, just anything, um, you're going to get so much closer there. And instead of being so worried or scared that you're not there or if your Mm -hmm. overarching goal seems so far, I think is the best mentality to have, even when you are a sophomore or junior or even a senior. I feel like senior year is very symptomatic of us feeling the pressure and kids comparing to each other or professors asking who's working where. And just, I think, taking a deep breath and breaking it down helps so much. Right. Well, there's a lot of well-known sayings out there, some I like and don't like, but one of the most popular ones is, you know, how do you eat an elephant, right? And the answer is one small bite at a time, right? So uh, I prefer the analogy of, you know, well, how do you eat, you know, a large salad or a large meal? You know, it's one bite at a time, right? And um, and then the other thing is, is, you know, in, enjoy every bite along the way. So there's no point, you know, having a real nice salad or a real nice meal if you don't enjoy the flavor between each bite, right? So... Absolutely. That's like the advice my mom always gave me. Stop eating so fast. You know, you've got to <laughs> savor every single bite. And that's what makes the meal so worthwhile. Sure. Well, like you said, the eating so fast comes from kind of the competition that's set up, right? So it's a highly competitive environment that you came from, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the other, the other thing that you uh, can do, and I had a guy last year actually that coached me and he would say to me, Bruce, it's about if you just aim to get 1% better per day, by the end of the year, you'll be 32 times better than you were than when you started. So, and that's, that's mathematically true. I and it's one raised to the power of one, you know, for 365 days. I think that's how it works. So mm-hmm. not a math major, but uh, mathematically, you can actually calculate how much better you can be if you do it that way. So thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I cool. very much agree with it. Again, I think that's something we don't talk about in school. It's always get to the end of your semester, get to the end of, X, Y, and Z internship, um, Mm -hmm. being very attracted to like an aspirational version of us as opposed Mm -hmm. to the the pieces of us that are going to get us there. You know, know, the whole 1% every day makes a big difference. That's essentially Mm -hmm. who you are at the very end. That's the aspirational you. Absolutely. So I wanted to welcome a few people. Hi, Asia. Asia is also, um, I would put you in the category of a high potential leader, Lois, so, or a high potential team member for sure. So Thank you. Uh, I was uh, recently talking to Asia about that very subject. And um, if you go back to a live or two ago, Asia talked about imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon, which I had not heard of before. So um, in our warm up conversation, we talked a little bit about that and doing the comparison game. So did you want to what about some of the unlearning from doing unnecessary comparison games that we were talking about? You want to talk about that? Yeah, I think, again, school really fosters the perfect environment for making comparisons. And it's not us going out of our way to do it. It's just kind of subconsciously instilled in us. Our parents do it. I know my parents did it um, out of love, of mm-hmm. course. But even if it's essentially a playing field and you're, you have like a 360 view of everyone around you. And naturally, you know, as ambitious students, I'm sure you have that inkling to compare. And sometimes, ironically, that comparison stops you mm-hmm. from actually going out and doing what your body, but your body has the potential to do. Right. And that is also. In college, like that was a big lesson for me, um, just having time at home to learn as opposed to going to school. That was a big kind of smack in the face of reality. 
Mm -hmm. And because of the lack of structure or what, what was the difference there for you? Oh my gosh. So much lack of structure is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. um, no one could have prepared for it. And so I am very grateful for my professors who did everything they could to make sure things did go by smoothly and um, losing that infrastructure kind of took away like 30% of college. I think college is very much that structure and why mm -hmm. students are kind of allowed to make mistakes. We're allowed to not be perfect. It's because we have a nice structure that's a tried and true and everyone's gone through it to kind of hold our hand. And those last few semesters or not semesters, the last few weeks of college kind of took that away. And you worked on your own time. You worked in your own space. You didn't have to commute to school anymore. You just logged. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't want to log on. But again, that power is now you. And that is a big separator from actual college where you don't really have a choice. If you have a small class, you got to go. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, in terms of the comparison game, we were also talking before we went live about the pressure for uh, grade point averages. So uh, perhaps you could share a little bit about that. I find that very fascinating that, um, you know, there was that comparison game and what, what some of the impacts of that are. So. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a big comparison game, huh? The GPA. Again, it's a tried and true. Mm -hmm. It's like the dreaded report card we had as kids, except this time it feels that much more detrimental if it goes down a point or anything like that. I know in my university it was a, it was a pretty big deal too, but since I was the advertising major, it wasn't as crucial or mission critical for me to have a perfect GPA. And I ended up with a fine GPA, but I know some kids had a lot of pressure if they took harder courses that meant you know, a few more points down, or some kids wanted to do postgrad, and that was a big, big thing for them too. But in the end, I remember my freshman year, I took it very seriously because I also came from a high school that, mm -hmm. you know, GP was your life. That was everything. And I spent so much time being fixated on this one math course that I took that really dropped my GPA, and I was just so frustrated and Again, there was no point in me being frustrated because now, as someone out of school, I'm realizing what was all this for? It was a lot mm. of pressure for essentially no reason. And you're still a fine person. You graduated. And what's more important is that you have the life skills from things outside of school. Extracurriculars, right. leading societies, creating events, internships. Those are the things that people do focus on. I know that sounds cliche, but that is at least what I've observed. and the GPA, I think, is fine as like a barometer for how you're performing in school. I think that's really important. You know, knowledge is power. But again, I think it's gotten to a point where people see a class that's going to drop their GPA and they immediately leave the class, drop the class and move on to the next. And I don't I don't know if that's really a good lesson for kids. Yeah, actually, uh, are you still there, Lois? Yes. Okay. All right. So we, we are having a little pause between our conversations. Apologies for that. And uh, no worries. Good, good time to welcome uh, Maria. Thank you. She's uh, here in California as well. And uh, yeah, if you're watching this as a recording, there is a little bit of lag time between me answering, uh, sorry, me asking Lois the question, her answering, so bear with us. Um, if you do have a question for either of us, you can put that in the comments and we will be certain to go back and review the comments and uh, make, make any relevant answers. Uh, if you're not connected to Lois, uh, I know she likes to meet new people, particularly here in Southern California, so uh, very open to that, right, Lois? Yes, very happy to. Yeah, cool. And uh, yeah, I think everybody I've seen on the feed so far, highly recommended connections for you, Lois, if you're not already connected to them. Really, really good people with a lot of unbelievable experience to share. And uh, they've all become meaningful connections for me. So it's been awesome. 
So uh, I wanted to go back to the comparison game and, uh, you know, also the fact that you're going around and around sometimes when your GPAs aren't quite up to speed. So um, offline, we were talking about uh, that creates a churn. So do you want to talk a little bit more about that and what we were talking about in terms of, you know, that around and aroundness when you drop drop things at short notice? So. Yeah, of course. Um, we were just speaking earlier, and Bruce came up with a really good analogy about comparisons and how that ironically does prevent you from going above or as like, like having that cream in your latte and having the cream rise. Instead, you're mm -hmm. kind of comparing it. Again, you feel a little bit daunted by no one but yourself, and you end up being at the bottom of like the butter churn, like, I don't know, the Amish issues. And you're essentially stuck there and you're churning over and over and you become denser and thicker and you just kind of drop because, right. you know, it's heavier. It doesn't rise anymore. And yeah. I thought, yeah, that was a very interesting analogy to kind of consider, especially for students right now who keep comparing and feel, you know, they're not unlocking their potential, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've um, I used to live in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is an Amish country. So I've actually tried the churn, you know, doing the churn handle. And it's oh, no way. It's really hard work. That's the other thing. So, <laughs> so you end up, you know, you, yeah, you end up you get hot and you get frustrated because, you know, the faster you churn, the the more difficult it seems to become. And um yeah, and I, I love your other visual. It's like, you know, when we go to a coffee house, if you like cream, they always say that, you know, the the good cream will always rise to the top of the coffee, right? And yes. Yeah. And the really exceptional cream, you can put your initials in the top of it and it'll <laughs> stay there for a while, right? So, yep. so you can kind of sign off on the thing that has become good, which is the good cream on top of your coffee. So uh, what would be another thing, uh, you know, as you reflect back in the last six months, Lois, from, you know, un unlearning from college, as it were? Mm. Another big one that just kind of popped up in my mind is learning to write for the workplace. I think so many kids don't realize that writing, even emails for school and your professors don't necessarily translate into the workplace where Sometimes, you know, your manager's going to reply with one sentence or a K signed off mm -hmm. from sent from iPhone. It's such a interesting juxtaposition, at least for me when I was younger and going to school and interning, I realized there's this dichotomy of I'd spend, you know, like 10 minutes drafting a beautiful long email, um, language, vocabulary, grammar, everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd get an email back that was one sentence concise, clear and done, mm -hmm. you know, and that took me a little bit of a learning curve, I must admit. Sometime around my senior year, that's when I got people, you know, approaching me being like, you don't have to write all this, you know, this, this ain't school anymore. This is the workplace. People get things done. You know, people be cogent. And mm -hmm. I think that's something really important, even kids nowadays. Um, when I was in my business fraternity and helping kids draft their emails, I would tell them, cut it short, take that out out of space mm -hmm. and it was so it was such a learning curve for a lot of people and myself included but i think that's something that the earlier you learn the better right yeah that's a great point because um certainly people that know me i tend to over communicate verbally uh but i've uh, also had to learn to be brief and bulletizing so uh you know, they say that less is more, you know, if you can write really well and get your message across in the minimal amount of words, then that really helps people. And um, particularly if the person you're writing to is very action orientated, you know, if they're predominantly an action orientated person, they they don't kind of want all the window dressing and all the fluff to go with it. They just want to know, OK, you know, what are you either what are you telling me or what do you want me to do or you know do you need my opinion or you know whatever whatever so oh yeah absolutely so um so you, did you have to basically learn to rewrite again was it that that dramatic of a difference kind of yeah um i 
in addition to being an advertising major, my concentration was in psychology. Mm -hmm. So again, that was another learning curve where I was going from business and comm classes that are noticeably different from, say, a normal psychology class that requires, you know, APA writing, formatting, mm -hmm. um, being punctual, everything. Everything is very important psychology. And learning how to write that was one thing. And then exiting that and moving on to actual workplace emailing was a bit of a learning curve and knowing that it's okay to have an email that's just say two sentences before it seems a little bit taboo in school they'll teach you like you have to go into detail you have to treat the person with respect and that's kind of implying that being short and concise isn't respectful which simply isn't true and mm -hmm. I'm learning the behind it was a big part of you know learning to rewrite awesome all right, so uh, a little bit about a personal hobby. Do you want to share the hobby that we were talking about <laughs> that you have? It's I know an it American will... hobby. <laughs> it will resonate, I know, with the people that are already on the feed for sure. So uh, why don't you share your, All your, right. your hobby? Uh, my hobby, but also my vice is definitely shopping. Mm -hmm. It's really bad, even before COVID when I was a little girl, I got this bad habit from my mom where I love shopping. I love, I love looking at things. Um, pink is my favorite color. Anything pink will just automatically draw my eye. Anything mm -hmm. that sparkles. And even today, like my shopping has gotten to astronomical levels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in times of COVID, you got, it's important to find something that, you know, takes your mind off of the other things and gives you a break. And I must say shopping, is like a little burst of serotonin for me every mm -hmm. single morning. Well, awesome. So it's amazing. Uh, I had a gut feel that you and Asia would get on. So I'm glad uh, that Asia is on here because Asia's brand anchor color is hot pink. So how about that? Amazing. Uh, I support uh, that all the way. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you would. And uh, also, she's uh, doing an advanced degree in uh, some subjects that I think you'll find fascinating based on your psychology major. So definitely going to be a good connection for you here, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. So what does, um, what does the rest of the year look like for you, Lois? Good question. I guess that's the million-dollar question that mm -hmm. everybody is asking. It is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I want to stay in SoCal forever. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first thing that comes to my mind when it comes to the question of the rest of the year or 2021. Right. When everything's a little bit foggy and I'm not so sure what that looks like, but I think, you know, that adds to the excitement. And I think coming out of school fresh is that chance for you to go stay to the East Coast and I know I did that in the middle of college for me, even though the furthest state I've ever been to at the time was probably, I think like Wisconsin. I've never been on the East Coast at the time. Mm -hmm. West Coast, homegrown my whole life, but making that leap was the biggest, I guess, blessing in my life mm -hmm. at the time. And even to this day, it was so important and impactful for me. And who knows? Um, I am definitely considering looking at the East Coast or even up North, maybe down South. Right. Um, I think there's just so much more for me to explore. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, the USA is an endless opportunity of totally different cultures and totally different scenery and background. And um, I think I've worked in 22 or 23 different states here in the US. And um, I've also worked uh, internationally. Of course, I was born in England. A lot of people don't know that but I was born in England and I moved here in 1994 and um, I've also worked in Mexico and Germany and France a little bit and uh, lots of different states here in the USA so uh, pretty pretty rounded travel still a lot of places still to go though so that's yeah, yeah that's lot. very cool which yeah. one's your favorite Ah, that is a great question. It it depends. Uh, I know which is my least favorite, which was Erie, Pennsylvania, because there was a six month snow season there, and I um I stuck mm -hmm. it out for six seasons. I I don't 
I used to live in an area where we got lake effect snow from Lake Erie. So on um, some days I would clean my car off 10 to 12 times a day. I used to do a regional dro job driving around. So, so after, you know, I got, I got sick and tired of the snow. It's great for fun, but if you're working in a snow environment, that wasn't not for me. So I, I, um, I think uh, St. Louis was in Missouri was the first place that I moved to. That was pretty memorable because I, I had to unlearn many things that you've had to do. Um, and basically I had to relearn a complete new lifestyle because every, every system is different here in the USA. Even though we speak uh, an English language, the, the systems are completely different between Europe and here. So yeah, a lot of unlearning, and it took me um, phew, took me two and a half, almost three years to figure out all the unlearning and the relearning. So it was a pretty major, major challenge for me, for sure. Right, I imagine. Yeah, so I can I can really relate to what people go through when they go through major changes, and um, and I think that that helps me to help other people when I'm mentoring them and guiding them. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're, we're kind of coming up to time here, not that we had a specific time limit. Some passing thoughts you'd like to share, Lois, and then also how, how would you like people to get a hold of you? Yeah, passing thoughts. Mm. I think I will leave with this last takeaway. Ironically, I got this from a professor um, who really meant the world to me and this was our communication theory class. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to go in, do the homework, move on, pass this class, do the next. But that class has really stuck with me. Um, he was really good at essentially packaging theories of, you know, philosophy and communication, and making it very applicable. So we talked about Kantianism, utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. And one thing that was really impactful was just one phrase that he gave, and it was impact over intention. And I joke about this with Patrick all the time that everything we do in the world revolves around impact over intention. In school, you're not necessarily taught that your impact overshadows the intention. A lot of the times intention is you know, paramount in us. The mm -hmm. more time you put in, the more work you put into something, the better it will be. But sometimes in the real world, hard work and time don't necessarily reap the benefits that you deserve mm -hmm. and I think that's a big thing too you can always have good intentions when doing anything for yourself for other people um, for a boss but really it's that impact that matters you know in the business world it's your results versus efforts mm -hmm. and that's why people say work smart not hard right because again it's your efforts and it's the results that's going to really impact you and the rest of the world ultimately and so that's just been something that stuck in my head for a while right? and a very good lesson to learn. That is awesome. So uh, if somebody heard that and can type it into the comments, impact over intention, that is such a powerful thinking process. And um, yeah, of course, I'm into simpler, faster, better. That's what I do. I try and live that life simpler, faster, better. So yeah, don't. I, I have somebody I work with regularly and he says, you know, don't Bruce, don't confuse, you know, effort with results, right? Mm. It's about getting the results and getting them in the most effective way that you can and making sure you don't waste process steps, time and money. So, so oh, that's what I'm, yeah. So that's that working smart, not working hard. It's, you know, do it with the, minimal amount of process steps time and money and um but i hadn't thought about impact over intention so um i'm actually going to put that i have a vision board behind me see i'm Ooh, actually gonna cool. very cool that's my uh you know you talked about long-term plans that's my long-term plan on one board so um if i may i'm gonna steal that one and put it on my board please do it's a gift All that right. keeps on giving Hey, and maybe you should create that as a hashtag, hashtag impact over intention. That would be cool. That would be cool. I've got to get my professor.
So Bert Ballard, I believe he's on LinkedIn too. Um, oh, okay. Great guy, taught me so much. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe you can go back into the uh, recording and, and add that credit. That would be awesome to give him credit. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. Yeah. So celebrate others. All right. Always. Well, um, thank you so much. If you could hang on, I'll let you know how you're going to get the recording, Lois. So again, awesome. uh, thank you for all of the live participation. I'm, I'm not real good at reading the comments and questions and trying to focus on Lois at the same time, but we will go back and answer any questions or uh, give any added input that you might be asking for. If you're watching this as a recording, I wanted to thank the live is powered by Rever. And if you want to learn more about how to empower your frontline teams, you can go to reverscore.com. And uh, again, please add your commentary. If you're watching this as a recording, it is always going to be in the featured section of my page. So that will be a great place for people to go back to. So, um, Thank you, Lois. Thank you. All right. So if you could hang on, say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for stopping right. by. Yeah, great. Good to see you.